A woman disappeared last year and she was gone for five days. And she was interviewed by a physician and told the physician that when she was in the woods, there were strange little people that were looking at her hiding behind bushes. And when she asked them for help, they wouldn't talk to her and they wouldn't come out of the bush and they tried to conceal themselves. Along the Appalachian Trail, there have been similar stories where a woman was chased on the Appalachian Trail by men that she could hear, sometimes see, but ran for two weeks trying to stay away from them. So there are these small little quips about what happened that kind of give me an insight as to what these people say happened. But the reality is, is that there's never enough there to really say with a surety what transpired. A common tale among all the indigenous native people, seemingly throughout the world, stories of little people abound. The Irish have their leprechauns, the Nordic folk have their gnomes and elves, and many other societies and cultures share similar folk legends and stories. The Cherokee, in particular, have a huge wealth of myths and legends, some of which go back not just centuries, but thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of years, to when the planet was formed and how all the different systems of nature on our planet Earth work. The ancient Cherokee, whom, as far as is known, were the first people to inhabit the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They have a legend or a story for everything you can imagine. Animals, insects, plants, trees, flowers, herbs, mountains, creeks, lakes, rivers, etc., etc., ad infinitum. The rich oral tradition of the Cherokee people have ensured that these tales are passed down from generation to generation. Even in the 21st century of high technology, there are initiatives underway to make sure that all the Cherokee legends and stories are recorded for posterity. One of the most fascinating and eerie stories in the Cherokee legend repository are the various and numerous accounts of what the Cherokee people call the Yunwe Sunsdi, which roughly translates into English as the little people. In the stories of old and even into modern day, these entities are sometimes described as being from the ethereal plane. But other times the Cherokee consider them to be a small, human-like race of people, about two to four feet high. Some versions of the Cherokee legend even have the little people initially arriving in the area aboard a flying silver disc. So perhaps the little people of the Smokies are actually little men from Mars? These little people of legend are also believed to be shapeshifters of a sort and use this to their advantage when deciding on what form to assume. According to the Cherokee legends, each of these little people can morph into three or four different types of spirits or entities. While sometimes the little people can be helpful, it seems they are especially good at finding lost articles if plied with certain foods or drinks as a reward, seeming to give preference to small children and the very old and or infirm. These self-same little folk can turn mean and dangerous at the drop of a hat if they are disrespected or feel like their space has been intruded upon. Oddly enough, like the little men Rip Van Winkle came across playing tin pens in the forest, the little people of the Great Smoky Mountains are said to possess the very power to cloud the human mind, resulting in confusion. There are even those among the Cherokee tribe who believe that this is why people are at risk of going missing in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You have upset the little people and will be allowed to wander the wilderness for your transgressions against them. A rather chilling thought, isn't it? Said to have the aforementioned ability to disguise themselves in a number of ways, the little people have the ability to remain invisible and undetected in general unless surprised by the appearance of a human, for example. There are times, however, that they can and do choose to reveal themselves to the populace at large. When this happens, there's usually not a single sighting, but a sudden flap or wave of sightings over a short period of time, which then subsides. Some people claim that these mass sightings only occur every generation or so. Then the little people, satisfied that they have scared and confused the humans, go back into hiding and enjoy their peaceful mountain ways. It is also said in the stories and legends that the little people live as close to nature as possible 
which would explain their fondness for such beautiful wilderness as we have here amongst the mountaintops and streams within the Great Smoky Mountains. They seem to be very spiritual beings by nature, and even when they do attempt to teach humans a lesson, the lesson will contain certain aspects, traits they feel we need as a people. Respect, kindness, and above all, a joy for life and living. When the little people are spotted by humans, it usually seems to be because they are so enraptured with the activity that they are involved in at the time. Some common examples of sightings of little people have them involved in dancing, singing, or some form of drumming or otherwise making nature music. While there is no one particular place that is better than any other to spot the little people in the Great Smoky Mountains, the areas with the most untamed nature seem like a best bet. Cades Cove, the north shore of Fontana Lake, the deep woods near Elkmont, Leconte, and Klingman's Dome. Interestingly enough, these areas are also purported to be among the most haunted within the National Park and also places where people have gone missing. Perhaps the spirits of the natural and the spirits of the supernatural both walk hand in hand among the dark forests and quiet glens of this great Smoky Mountains National Park. If you do happen to be one of the few or fortunate enough to spot the little folk, remember to keep your distance and do not approach them lest you be mesmerized and left to wander about the mountains, perhaps forever. Reverence and respect should always keep you safe. While this may sound tongue-in-cheek to our modern ways and means, the Cherokee did, and still do, take the cautionary tales very seriously, sometimes avoiding certain places in the mountains altogether. Hello, friends. Now, it's often said that flying is the safest way to travel. While plane crashes are often highlighted by the media, the occurrence is extremely rare. In fact, statistics suggest that you're more likely to die driving to the airport than flying across the country. According to a recent Huffington Post article, the past 10 years have been the best in the country's aviation history, with only 153 fatalities. To put this statistic into perspective, the Associated Press determined it is equivalent to two deaths for each 100 million passengers flying commercially. Compare that tiny fraction with the 300,000 plus deaths from motor vehicles that take place each year. With all this being said, it should come as no surprise that when an accident or crash does happen involving any form of commercial aircraft, people want answers as to what went wrong. On Christmas Eve, 1975, one particular plane, a Cessna, piloted by a man named Peter Gibbs, departed from an airfield adjacent to the Glen Forza Hotel on the Isle of Mull in Scotland, and has left us with many perplexing, not to mention troubling questions that have yet to be answered. The story has come to be known as the Great Mull Air Mystery. Peter Gibbs' almost lifelong passion for flying began right around the end of the Second World War. The 55-year-old businessman had forged a reputation in property development as the managing director of Gibbs & Ray. After spending the day working on an investment in a hotel on the Isle of Skye, Peter Gibbs sat down for dinner in the restaurant of the Glen Forza Hotel. After he had eaten, he suddenly decided he wanted to take his plane out for a quick night flight. Peter Gibbs was a driven man with a no-nonsense reputation, and when the hotel staff tried to warn him that this would be a bad idea, mainly due to a ban on night flights in the area, and also there would be no landing lights for him to use as a guide when coming back down, he reminded them that he wasn't asking for their permission and could do as he very well pleased with his own plane. Even the black and moonless sky that night was no deterrent to him. After all, he considered... He would station his girlfriend, Felicity Granger, on the airstrip with a flashlight, and he insisted this would be enough light to provide him with a visual reference. What could go wrong? It was 9.30 p.m. when the couple headed for the airstrip. A hotel guest named David Howitt was there that night and witnessed what he would later describe as a perfect takeoff. He said he hadn't detected any signs of a malfunction or other problems. Felicity waited for approximately half an hour before returning inside and telling the hotel staff that Peter had not returned. 
Sleet was now falling heavily, which made visibility extremely poor, especially for flying in a small plane. The hotel staff called in the local police. When the authorities arrived on the scene, they inspected the airfield for any signs of trouble that could account for the disappearance. They found nothing unusual, however. The presumed flight path also failed to give them any hint of a problem. Due to the inclement weather, which was only getting worse for the second, before they could even start an official search for Peter Gibbs, a decision was made to call off that search for the rest of the night. The very next morning, Christmas Day of 1975, a full-scale investigation was launched into what could have possibly happened to Peter Gibbs after he made his completely flawless takeoff from the airstrip the night before. He still hadn't returned. While RAF and Navy Air Service helicopters scoured the waters with sonar, hundreds of volunteers searched virtually the entire island on foot. Neither Peter Gibbs nor the aircraft could be found. For the next four months, speculation was rife as to his true fate. The confusion and mystery ended the following April when local shepherd Donald McKinnon replaced one question with several more. On a hill about a mile from the Glen Forsa Hotel, he discovered the fully clothed body of Peter Gibbs. It was located about 400 feet from the base of the hill. He was in full view of anyone who might have ventured onto the hill. This was really puzzling as the hill was part of the first search and many searches thereafter, and nobody had obviously come across this body or any scrap of evidence there before. The only injury to the body was a minor cut on one of his legs. Keep in mind, too, that this hill, where his body was eventually found, was a place where shepherds roamed daily, and nobody had seen him up there until this point. There was also another question about how Peter Gibbs could have ended up where he did. If we are to assume that the plane did crash into the sea, he would have had to swim to shore, climb up a sheer cliff face, cross the road that led to the hotel, then head a quarter of a mile uphill only to lie down and suffer the effects of exposure. And as improbable as all of that sounds, there was no trace of seawater or marine microorganisms found on his skin or his clothes. Some people even speculated that Peter Gibbs left the aircraft in flight somehow. Because his body showed no signs of major trauma, they believed that he may have bailed out on his own accord for some reason. Perhaps, they speculated, the plane developed a fault during the flight. However, there was no signs of a parachute anywhere near the body. If he did parachute out of the Cessna, then what became of the parachute? It doesn't seem reasonable that he would go out of his way to conceal a parachute and then return to the hill to lie down and die. Plus, a parachute was never found anywhere near the area all this took place. Also, why hadn't he sought help, or at the very least, found his girlfriend, Felicity Granger, who was waiting there for him, and most likely very nervous and worried about him, to tell her he was safe and give some kind of explanation? None of this made any kind of sense, and the investigators were getting no further in finding any clues or answers to all those questions. One of the main questions on everyone else's mind, though, was what happened to the aircraft itself? Though it was assumed that the Cessna was now at the bottom of the ocean somewhere, was this really very likely, considering the lack of a parachute and also there having been no evidence on or near him that Peter had even been in the sea? Eleven years later, in September of 1986, hopes were risen that at least the plane would be found when a pair of brothers named Richard and John Grieve were out clam fishing. They came forward and stated that they found a small red and white plane about 100 feet down on a seabed a kilometer or so off the coast of Oban. According to the brothers, it had the registration number G-AVTN, and as best as they could tell, the cockpit was empty. Both insisted that the wings had been sheared off and the condition of the plane was severe. A hole was found in the windshield, and one of the wheels had been ripped from its housing. The engine was found a short distance from the fuselage. The entire scene strongly indicated that this crash had been a very violent one. Both doors of the cockpit were apparently locked from the inside, though. The only way out was by the hole in the windscreen. When salvage teams learned of this discovery, they set out to retrieve the plane. Unfortunately, they were unable to find it. The only evidence that the brothers had indeed found it at all were some blurry photos. However, none of these showed the registration number. 
Now, there have been many theories over the years as to what could have possibly happened to Peter Gibbs that fateful Christmas Eve night. One idea was that Peter was actually murdered. This theory suggested that his killer somehow managed to conceal him or herself on board the plane without anyone, Peter Gibbs included, knowing about it. Either during or shortly after this textbook perfect takeoff, the killer struck. Having done the deed, the killer then faced the problem of disposing of the body. The obvious solution? Simply open the door and let gravity take care of it. Somehow, though, the perpetrator would have had to accomplish this without causing any additional harm to the corpse. Not very likely. It was also highly unlikely because the area where the body was found was highly traveled by the locals in the area. There were also the aforementioned shepherds who roamed and traversed that very hill every single day. It just isn't possible that all these people just happen to miss a corpse lying on the hill every single day for four months. Going back to the theory of the killer, assuming for just a moment that he or she actually did accomplish all the above mentioned impossibilities, they would have had to have had to abandon and dispose of the aircraft itself. If both doors were locked from the inside, as alleged by the Greve brothers and as seen on the aircraft photos found with no serial number on it, think about that. The doors were both locked from the inside. So did the killer or killers just hang tight, hope for the best, and remain locked inside of the Cessna while it crashed into the sea? And again, a crash which appears to have been very violent, not a very reasonable theory at all. While many theories abound in this case, there is only one which most people think is even actually feasible. If you take into account all the evidence recovered to back any theory at all up, which wasn't much to begin with, this theory says that Peter Gibbs lost sight of the airfield and carried out his stated plan in such an event, which was to fly as low and slow as possible and jump out. While waiting for police to arrive, his girlfriend, Felicity Granger, mentioned that just before taking off, Peter had told her that if everything went wrong, he would throttle right back and jump to safety. Okay. From the moment Peter Gibbs decided to indulge himself and take his Cessna out on a whim that night, despite the protest of at least a dozen well-meaning hotel employees, there have been so many questions and so much mystery surrounding the situation. Even before he took off, There were reports of a second set of lights on the airfield. Felicity swore that she was alone during the takeoff. And also, even though it was described as textbook perfect, the takeoff itself seemed to take longer than was necessary. Could Peter Gibbs have been distracted or busy with something? Another aspect of this whole incident that cannot be readily explained is the condition of his body. It was in remarkably good condition. No signs of decomposition or animal interference but it was confirmed that he had died on the night he disappeared. Everything that is known or assumed about the Great Mull Air Mystery defies all attempts at explanation. Even now, some 40 years later, there are questions upon questions upon questions, and none with any real answers. How did Peter Gibbs' corpse end up on a much-used hill four months after disappearing, with no signs of decomposition or animal predation? Was it his plane that was found by the brothers? And, if it was then how did he survive such a violent impact with barely a scratch? Where would his corpse have been during the first few months of that year? In 2013, the Royal Navy admitted to the discovery of a downed aircraft in the sea off Oban, supporting the brothers' earlier claims. However, this wreckage was estimated to be largely intact. Either the brothers were mistaken, or Peter Gibbs' plane is still somewhere waiting to be discovered in the deep. We may never know the answers to the mystery surrounding the last flight of Peter Gibbs. And as we said, theories abound, only none seem to tie up even multiple details, let alone every single one. So much would have needed to have gone exactly wrong for Peter Gibbs to have ended up the way he did. Many questions remain about the body as well. Where on earth could it have been for the first four months or so that Peter was missing? It was definitely not on that hill, according to the locals. It had to have been somewhere. There are many very strange theories out there, ranging from a UFO encounter to an actual and full-blown alien abduction. But again, none of this could possibly be verified, even if you were to believe it. The killer theory doesn't hold much water either, despite many people being said to have an axe to grind with Peter Gibbs himself at that point in his life. 
Nowadays, too, with all these fresh eyes looking into the investigation, some can't help but be reminded of the young, athletic, and talented college students going missing and ending up found in nearby water sources. These young men are missing for, say, 90 days, but they've only been in the water for 30, or deceased for 40. What do you think could have happened to Peter Gibbs on Christmas Eve of 1975? Do you think there's a UFO connection, or some sort of connection to the missing phenomenon? Or perhaps you subscribe to the killer or killer's lying in wait theory? Or was it something else altogether? Hello friends, and welcome to another episode. Today we're going a little bit deeper into the world of the unknown. We'll be discussing the entity known as the Black Flash that terrorized Provincetown, Massachusetts in the late 1930s until 1940. According to legends, the Black Flash first appeared in the fall of 1938 when children in Provincetown reported a sinister figure lurking in the dunes or hiding behind trees. They described the entity as being about eight feet tall and dressed all in black. He wore a long black cape and black hood that covered his head. Some children also said that he had long silver ears and flaming eyes. At first, the adults in town just dismissed these accounts as stories from kids with overly active imaginations. But that changed when an adult woman named Maria Costa encountered the Black Flash in October. She was walking by the town hall when the Black Flash jumped out from behind the bushes and started to chase her. She stated the Black Flash made a strange buzzing noise like a giant insect. Maria was terrified and ran into a nearby coffee shop where she hysterically explained what happened. Several customers ran outside but couldn't find a trace of the Black Flash. He had simply vanished. Other people also reported seeing the Black Flash that fall. One teenage boy ran to the police station after the creature jumped out at him on his way home from the library. The boy said that the creature was chasing him and it spit blue flames at him. All along, he was just within arm's reach. He goes on to say that the creature could have grabbed him, but it seemed it only wanted to torment him. The boy said he thought the creature was trying to scare him to death. According to reports, the Black Flash had the ability to leap over tall fences and was even seen levitating. Local rancher Charles Farley saw the creature lurking in his backyard. Charles fired his shotgun at it and the Black Flash just made a buzzing and clicking noise and then was seen jumping over a nearby fence that bordered the property and led back into the woods and vanished from sight. A few days later, the police were called and told that the Black Flash was in a school playground, which was surrounded by a tall fence. Four officers entered the yard with flashlights and pistols drawn. They got a good look at the Black Flash, and one officer swore his face was really just a silver-painted mask. They told the Flash to surrender or they'd fire, but the Flash just made a buzzing sound and jumped over the ten-foot fence that surrounded the school. Then he once again simply vanished before their eyes. The Black Flash terrorized Provincetown in whole for about seven years. The last time the Black Flash appeared was in December of 1945. Four children from the Gennard family were playing in their yard on Standish Street when they saw the Flash creeping toward them through the fog. They ran into their house terrified. Their parents weren't home and they didn't know what to do. They could hear the flash turning the doorknobs of the house, trying to get in. The youngest children hid behind chairs, but the oldest boy, Alan, filled a bucket with hot water and ran up to the second floor. He could see the flash outside right below him. He opened the window and dumped the bucket of water on the flash's head. The flash let out a startled gasp and then slunk off like a wet cat. And that was the last time the black flash was ever seen in Provincetown. Now, all these stories may sound like an urban legend, but there is evidence that something really did occur. On October 26, 1939, the Provincetown Advocate printed a front-page article titled, Fall Brings Out the Black Flash, Hard Winter Certain, As Cabin Fever Stories Start. To quote from the article, Here it is only October, 
and the black flash has been prowling, scaring kids so that they won't go out nights and won't go to bed, grabbing women, jumping over 10-foot edges with no trouble at all. In another article released on November 9, 1940, the paper ran a short follow-up piece titled, Chief Denies Current Rumors. Chief of Police Anthony P. Tarbers this morning absolutely denied the rumors current that the so-called Black Flash had been captured. The chief stated that, as far as I'm concerned, the Black Flash is dead and gone. Those are the only two articles available that mention the Black Flash. However, there are more accounts that have been written about and documented. In the early 1980s, the writer Robert Ellis Cahill visited Provincetown and interviewed many locals about the Black Flash. Locals said that there were several theories about who or what the Phantom was. Some locals were convinced that the Black Flash was of supernatural or paranormal in origin, while others thought he might be teenager John Williams, who was quite fast and a weightlifter. But although John Williams was athletic enough to be the Black Flash, he was a sailor and often at sea when the Flash appeared. Francis Marshall, a retired Provincetown police officer, told Cahill that the Black Flash was actually four men who terrorized the town as a hoax. Marshall refused to divulge their names, but said that two of them were already deceased by the time he spoke to Cahill. So, was the Black Flash really just a short-lived hoax? There are interesting parallels between the Flash and Spring Hill Jack, a legendary monster from England. Spring Hill Jack was first seen in London in 1837. The last sighting was in 1904. Like the Black Flash, Spring Hill Jack was described as a tall human figure dressed in black, often with a black hood on his head. Some witnesses said he had fiery red eyes, and others said he could spit out blue fire. He was called Spring Hill Jack because he could jump so high people thought he had springs in his shoes. All this is very, very similar to the Black Flash. If you believe in the supernatural, were they the same entity? Or were people just telling similar stories? It's been 80 years since the last sighting of the Black Flash, and the majority of witnesses are now deceased. So I guess we will never know the truth of who or what the Black Flash was. With that said, if you happen to be in Provincetown, be sure to keep your eyes open for the Black Flash because he may just be back and waiting for you. The Kaz 2 Ghost Yacht Mystery On April 20th, 2007, a white catamaran was found drifting 88 nautical miles, or 163 kilometers, off the northeastern coast of Australia. Like the famous story of the Mary Celeste, the crew of the Kaz 2 had mysteriously vanished without a trace starting an enduring mystery known as the Ghost Ship of Australia. Search and Rescue found the boat eerie upon entering it. An inquest blamed misadventure and bad luck by the crew, but what really happened is a question that will never be fully answered as 14 years on and the crew's bodies remain missing. Now, the start of the Cast 2 voyage from Airlie Beach was normal. The Cast 2 crew consisted of Captain Derek Des Charles Batten, 56, and James Alfred Tunstead, 69, as well as Peter John Tunstead, 63. All three retired men lived in Perth in Western Australia. They cast off from Airlie Beach in Queensland, Australia on Sunday, April 15, 2007, and were heading for Townsville on their way to Perth. It was an eight-week voyage. Townsville is around 270 kilometers to the north of Airlie, and the Great Barrier Reef lies off its coast. They had previously left Chute Harbor just to the east, and ended up in Airlie because they had a GPS issue. Batten had bought the Kaz 2 in 2006 for $80,000 and sailed it a couple times since then after taking a sailing course. Prior to the latest voyage, he took courses in coastal navigation, radio, and a first aid course. The Tunstons were not nautical novices either, since they sailed together from the time they were 18 years old and even worked in the radio rooms of the Volunteer Sea Rescue. But they were inexperienced on larger vessels. The last known contact of the family members with any of the crew was made one and a half hours after it left port when one crew member was contacted by his wife. Graham Douglas, the boat's previous owner, had warned the men not to leave the Whitsunday area because they did not seem to have enough experience. 
He said the men appeared nervous about the trip, but anxious to get underway since the original start date had been postponed because of bad weather and the fact that they had trouble understanding the vessel's global positioning system. He was quoted as saying, I said, if you're not ready, don't go. Now, here's where the mystery starts. The first indication that there was a problem came on Wednesday, April 18th, 2007, when a helicopter reported spotting the CAS-2 adrift in the vicinity of the Great Barrier Reef. On April 20th, maritime authorities caught up with the boat and boarded it. Strangely, no one was on board the vessel. John Hall, Queensland's Emergency Management Office, QEMO, said, What they found was a bit strange in that everything was normal. There was just no sign of the crew. The QEMO revealed that the boat was in serviceable condition and was laid out as if the crew were still on board. Food and cutlery were set out on the table, a laptop computer was set up and turned on, and the engine was still running. Officials also confirmed that the boat's emergency systems, including its radio and GPS, were fully functional and that it still had a full complement of life jackets. There was also a small boat still hoisted on the stern of the catamaran, and the anchor was up. The only signs that were out of the ordinary, other than the disappearance of the crew, of course, was that the main sail had been badly shredded and that there was no life draft on board. It is unknown, however, whether there ever was one on board. Rescue officer Corey Benson said that he found an eerie scene when he was winched down from a helicopter to search the stricken vessel. He saw the discarded coffee cup and newspapers and found knives strewn on the floor. My biggest fear was being attacked by somebody who did not want me on the boat. I was 160 kilometers out to sea with no backup. I didn't know if someone was going to burst through a cupboard and go at me with a knife. I saw the knives on the ground, but no blood, and thought, what the... Then we began the search for the CAS-2 crew. Search and rescue efforts began on April 18th with boats and a Navy aircraft with infrared capability looking in the vicinity of the locations identified in the video and data from the GPS system. At the same time, Bowen Voluntary Military Rescue launched a coastal and island search. The next day, a full-scale search and rescue effort was launched involving volunteer rescue units from several towns as well as the Townsville's Coast Guard, two rescue helicopters, nine airplanes, and two commercial vessels. Dr. Paul Luckin, a survival time expert, was consulted. He concluded that it was unlikely that the men were still alive if they were still in the water as they had probably gone overboard three to four days earlier. The team still had hope, however, that the men could have reached land and continued searching until 4 p.m. on April 21st when the air and sea search was called off. Another coastline search was launched on Monday, April 23rd after some new information had come in but that search proved fruitless and was called off on April 25th. So now the investigations into the CAS-2 mystery began in earnest. On February 20th, CAS-2 was towed into Townsville Port for forensic examination, and on the next day, Sergeant Bardell and Sergeant Malloy of the Queensland Police searched the ship for signs of foul play. No evidence for this was found, and they discovered that the cabin was neat and tidy apart from some magazines, a piece of newspaper, and a wine cask which was lying on the floor. It was later determined that these items ended up on the floor while the ship was being towed to shore. In the sink were a few butter knives, and on a bench in the galley, a plastic sheath of fishing knives was found. They did not appear to have been used recently. Under Desbatten's bed, in a sealed container, the investigators found a firearm and some ammunition, none of which was used. In a drawer, they found an additional single bullet of the same caliber. After analyzing data from the catamaran's GPS system, police deduced that it had been steered in a northeast direction into an area where rough seas were building on the day of the departure. Later in the afternoon, the GPS data showed it to be adrift. The investigators also recovered a video recording filmed by James Tunstead on April 15th at 10.05 a.m., shortly before the men disappeared. The video showed Des Batten was at the helm with a vessel under sail, the sea was choppy, and none of the men were wearing life jackets. Peter Tunstead was sitting on the aft stairway of the boat fishing, and a long white rope can be seen trailing behind the boat. The video showed the coastline in the area, and this helped investigators pinpoint the exact location of the ship. It was in the area between Gumbrel Island, Grassy Island, and Armit Island. Next began the inquest into the Cas-2 incident. 
Between August 4 and 7, 2008, an inquest into the men's disappearance began in the Townsville Coroner's Court, led by Queensland State Coroner Michael Barnes. In total, 27 witnesses were called to testify and 107 pieces of evidence submitted. Jennifer Batten testified that her husband, Des, was an experienced and careful yachtsman, had been around boats for 25 years, and that he was acutely aware of the need for safety. He had earned his recreational skipper's ticket and a qualification in marine radio. Every summer, they traveled together to Rottnest Island on various motorboats, although Cast 2 was their first sailboat. After they bought it, the couple took a six-week sailing course and then sailed Cast 2 around the Whit Sundays twice. Apart from a minor problem with the propeller, the trips were without issue. Batten's wife also stated that the original plan was to sail the Cast 2 to Fremantle as a couple, but that Batten was worried that just two people aboard might not be safe. He decided to take his neighbors, brothers Peter and James Tunstead, with him instead. The trip was planned over several months and discussed daily as they plotted routes with the help of a computer. Jennifer Batten continued, They allowed themselves six to eight weeks to get back to Fremantle, but because Des and Peter were retired, it didn't really matter how long they took. They didn't want to sail at night for safety reasons, and they planned to stay reasonably close to the shore. Now, although Batten was taking medications for high cholesterol, mild diabetes, and had suffered a heart attack at age 50, she believed that he was well enough and fit for the journey. Also heard at the inquest was Graham Douglas, the previous owner of the Cast 2, who had sold the boat to Batten. He stated the boat was in good condition when it was sold and that he had met the men on the night before they set sail. He also helped the men plan part of their route and was surprised to see that, according to the police, the men had deviated from their planned route that was programmed into their GPS system. Gavin Howland, the skipper of a commercial fishing vessel called the Jillian, testified that on April 16, 2007, while fishing on a reef off Bowen, he and his crew saw a white yacht with a torn sail drifting sideways between the reefs through a narrow passage at up to 3 kilometers per hour in a north-northeast direction with the current. He came within 50 meters of the boat, but was unable to spot anyone on board. This was two days before the Coast Guard spotted the cast to adrift off the coast of Townsville, and the day after authorities believed the men went missing. Howland found it odd that a sailboat was in an area noted for its shallow water and rocks. He didn't attempt to contact the boat or the authorities, however. Howland told the inquest that it did not occur to him that the crew of the yacht might be in distress and went on to say, It did seem a bit strange to me, but I just have this rule that no one goes near another vessel. Sergeant Paul Malloy, one of the three forensic police officers who examined the cast two after she was towed back to shore in April 2007, told the inquest that he did not believe the men had met with foul play. He spent several hours combing the ship for signs of a struggle, but found no evidence that anyone besides the three-man crew of the vessel had ever been on board. We came to the conclusion the boat itself was not a crime scene, he told the inquest. After questioning by Peter Tunstead's widow Francis as to why the police did not check for fingerprints, Sergeant Malloy said his years of experience told him it was not necessary. He says, We were there for a long time. We pulled the boat apart and found nothing untoward. If there was any indication of foul play, we would have taken every measure we could to examine that boat. And now in the conclusions reached by the inquest, State Coroner Barnes admits in his official report that he cannot be so definitive about the circumstances under which the deaths occurred. However, based on the eyewitness accounts, the video found on board, and the state of the yacht in which it was found, the report proposed the following scenario. On Sunday, April 15, 2007, at 10.05 a.m., the Cast 2 was sailing in the vicinity of George Point. Up to that moment, everything was going as planned, but in the following hour, their situation changed dramatically. The men hauled in the white rope that was trailing behind the boat and belted it upon the foredeck, possibly to dry, next to the locker it was normally kept in. For reasons unknown, James Tunstead then took off his t-shirt and glasses and placed them on the back seat. The report says that since the men's fishing lure was found entangled in the ship's port side rudder, an obvious explanation would be that one of them tried to free the lure and fell overboard while doing so. Standing on the boat's sugar scoop, which is a platform at the back of the ship close to the waterline, while the boat is moving is perilous and falling in is easy, but getting back on board from this predicament is almost impossible. One of the other men came to the rescue of his brother while Batten, still on board, started the motor and realized he had to drop the sails before he could go back for his friends. 
As he left the helm to drop the sails, a deviation of the ship's course or wind direction could have easily caused a jibe, swinging the boom across the deck and knocking Batten overboard. This could even have happened before Batten was able to untie and throw out the life ring to his friends. A blue coffee mug found near the life ring may support this. Since the boat was traveling before wind and at a speed of 15 kilometers per hour, it would have been out of reach of the men within seconds. The report states, From that point, the end would have been swift. None of them were good swimmers. The seas were choppy. The men would have quickly become exhausted and sunk beneath the waves. The report ruled out foul play and stage disappearance. Other explanations for the disappearance of the Cast 2 crew included weather. According to authorities in Townsville, the weather had been windy and the sea had been rough between the time the Cast 2 departed and was found drifting. This led authorities to speculate that the crew may have experienced some form of sudden difficulty during rough weather and gone overboard. However, one issue with this theory is that the contents of the cabin, including a table, did not seem to have been disrupted in any way. Relatives of the missing men say that the boat's condition makes this unlikely and point to discrepancies such as the fact that the men's fishing lines and laundry were set out and that their life jackets were still stowed, which indicates that they were not experiencing rough weather at the time of their disappearance. Another theory was that the crew may have been kidnapped. Also noted was the fact that the cast two was found with its fenders out, leading to speculation that the boat may have been docked with another as yet unknown vessel to which the crew might have willingly or unwillingly transferred. Hope Hemming, niece of boat owner Des Batten, said, The fenders were out on their yacht, and the only reason you ever put them out is when another boat comes aside or if you want to come to rest against the wharf. The Townsville police said, Small craft commonly leave their fenders out at all times, making it impossible to draw any definitive conclusions from this fact. Yet another theory? Faulty GPS. Volunteer radio operator Ivan Orms recorded that CAS-2 radioed in at 6.45 p.m. on April 15th, giving its position as George Point. This is the last known contact with the CAS-2. It should have taken them a short time to reach George Point, and that's unclear what took them so long to arrive there. One explanation is that they were just fishing the whole day, but another explanation is that they had problems with their GPS since they already tried to set off on April 14th, but were forced to return then because of the non-functioning GPS. That incident was because of a user error and it was easily fixed, so CAS-2 set off early the next day. Yet another theory points that they may have been lodged on a sandbar. Perhaps the catamaran became stuck on a sandbar near George Point, where the boat's last radio message was made. When the men jumped overboard to push it free, a gust of wind blew and the boat drifted away, leaving them stranded. This would explain why towels were left out on the deck. It's also a theory about a freak wave. One crew member may have been washed over by a freak wave and the others were lost trying to rescue him. But then, if it were a freak wave, why the shredded sail? Some other lesser theories include suggestions that the men staged their own disappearance for insurance purposes and one of the wilder theories was that some kind of paranormal event had happened aboard their catamaran or it had been attacked by a whale or a giant squid. Maybe they were even abducted by extraterrestrials? Some unanswered questions on the Cast 2 mystery are as follows. Why was the jib sail shredded? The triangular sail, called the jib, one of the so-called head sails on a modern boat, was completely shredded when the catamaran was discovered. What happened to it? The coroner's report mentions, as he left the helm to drop the sails, a deviation of the ship's course or wind direction could have easily caused a jibe, swinging the boom across the deck and knocking Batten overboard. However, such a jibe would have not have caused the damage to the jib that was found. One ton boulder called Wizard Rock disappears in Prescott National Forest, then suddenly reappears. Forest officials in Arizona were mystified this past October when local landmark Wizard Rock, a one ton boulder, suddenly vanished from Prescott National Forest. The Wizard Rock, a distinctive black boulder marked with striking lines of white quartz, is a well-known local landmark along State Route 89 in Prescott National Forest near the center of Arizona. In addition to being an admired natural monument and stopping point for tourists, the Wizard Rock is also a hefty formation, estimated to weigh around one ton, 
so park officials were shocked to find it had gone missing. But it gets stranger. Two weeks after the Wizard Rock disappeared, it mysteriously reappeared to the exact spot and position, almost like it had never moved. In addition, Park Services stated that there were no visible marks on the ground to suggest it was moved by a large piece of equipment. As of December 2019, the disappearance and reappearance of the Wizard Rock remains a mystery. Serious force snaps hundreds of trees in Washington near Olympic National Park. An unexplained incident happened near the forests of Olympic National Park on the shores of Washington State, and Park Service officials and scientists have been left baffled by a lack of definitive explanations. In the early morning hours of January 27, 2018, an extremely powerful force of some kind knocked down over 100 trees along the north shore of Lake Quinault on Washington's Olympic Peninsula. While high winds or some other meteorological phenomenon was immediately assumed to be the cause, Weather data show that nothing out of the meteorological ordinary occurred. So then what exactly happened in the woods of Washington that morning? To make matters even stranger, on Friday, April 5th, 2019, 26 power poles came crashing down in a cascade effect in Tukwila, Washington. The terrifying incident was recorded and shows one of the power poles crashing through the roof of a passing vehicle. I would like to stand here and tell you that I know what caused it, but I don't. We've ruled things out. But we've not rolled anything in, Seattle City Light CEO Deborah Smith said. Seattle City Light says they ruled out lightning and weather's causes, but as of today, this incident also remains a mystery. Lost Boy Larry On 7 August 1973, New Mexico CB radio operators heard the disturbing pleas and cries for help from a little boy by the name of Larry. He said he was trapped in a red and white pickup truck with his father who had died, possibly of a heart attack. He said he and his father had been rabbit hunting when his father collapsed on the steering wheel, and as a result, the truck had flipped into a ravine where the doors became jammed, making it unable to escape. The messages were reported to the local authorities, and the police launched a search for the little boy in the foothills of New Mexico and near the Petroglyph National Monument. Despite the fact that some people thought it was a hoax, the police took it seriously. It was definitely possible that this child was somewhere in the desert. However, Larry had no idea where he was. He was struggling to answer questions and became confused easily. Some people thought that perhaps he had a head injury. He said his legs and knees had been hurt in the crash. By the second day, Larry was not transmitting regularly. Other people joined in the conversation on their CB radios. Some of them were concerned citizens who honestly wanted to help. Others were hecklers who wanted to make fun of Larry. By the third day, Larry's voice was growing weaker. He said that his father hadn't moved at all and searchers were sure the man must be dead. On the fourth day, Larry's voice was growing very faint, and he said he knew he wasn't going to survive. Shortly afterwards, Larry's transmissions faded away, and he was never heard from again. The signal was heard in Arizona, California, and Wyoming. He was switching between channels, desperate for somebody to help him. Those that spoke to Larry are adamant that it was not a hoax because of the emotion and terror in his voice. But others call it a hoax and suggest that after 40 years, something surely would have been found. Strange Structures in Santa Fe National Forest Forest Service officials and park rangers in the Santa Fe National Forest have discovered numerous mysterious structures, which have them scrambling for explanations. The structures range in size, but have all been constructed out of fallen trees and limbs, with some reaching over 20 feet tall and dozens of feet in diameter. Whoever, or whatever, is building the structure seems to be accelerating its efforts, as more and more have been found in recent weeks. The Forest Service has no idea who is building them or why, but their response so far has been to dismantle any that are found. Bigfoot's not going to be happy. The destruction of these mystery structures is to mitigate the forest fire threat they create. National Forest spokesperson Julianne Overton says that whatever the structures are for, they are dangerous for the park and its visitors. They may have as many as a thousand pieces of wood in them. The wood is seasoned and dry, and the design is similar to a classic kindling pyramid, but on a much larger scale and to exacerbate the obvious fire danger, people appear to be using fire rings inside many of the structures. While some of the structures appear to be a rudimentary teepee-like shape, which could be used for shelter, others appear to be a solid cone of wood. No one knows who is building these structures or why, but many have suggested they are the work of a cult that uses the wooden frameworks for ritualistic purposes. Others claim that Bigfoot is responsible for the structures, saying that some of these logs are so large and heavy that no human could possibly lift them alone, or even with the help of others. 
secret base for man-eating aliens being built in Tonto National Forest. The United States Department of Agriculture has released a number of files about alleged alien and UFO activity on land managed by the U.S. Forest Service. The U.S. Forest Service data was obtained by John Greenwald, founder of the Black Vault website, who obtains and publishes formerly confidential official data on aliens and UFOs. Records of the service's southwestern regional office in Albuquerque, New Mexico, detail a bizarre call from an alleged witness to the construction of an alien base in the Tonto National Forest near Phoenix, Arizona. An email was sent by the department to all rangers on December 30, 2013, detailing the extraordinary encounter. The email said, David received a call this morning at the front desk from a mail caller reporting the construction of a secret government installation upstream from the Salt River Canyon past Pinal Creek, upstream from Roosevelt Lake. Caller claims to have seen construction cranes coming out of the side of the cliffs, miniature stealth planes and UFOs, aliens and people working together at the site, and aliens eating people. He found a severed head and claims to have pictures of some of this stuff. Caller reported that he is 60, not crazy, and doesn't do drugs. He said he had already called the office at the lake, but he didn't know if those people were turning the other cheek or maybe those people had been paid off. The records do not detail if any action was taken in response to the strange tip-off, but the email added, Please let me know if there are any talking points to be developed. I'm sure the Phoenix media will be all over this. P.S. David and I aren't doing drugs either. There are long-standing claims by alien conspiracy theorists that there are aliens living here on Earth and the government knows about it, but it's kept top secret from the public for fear of what would happen if they knew. Bizarrely, this is not the first reference to there being a secret military-slash-alien base in the Tonto National Forest. George A. Filer is a former U.S. Air Force intelligence officer who claims aliens and UFOs were actually aiding the U.S. during the Vietnam War. He is now the director of the eastern section of the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, based in the United States, which is the world's largest organization dedicated to UFO and alien investigation. In a series of online reports known as Filer's Files, a man called Scott Hackman spoke of a base being in the National Forest where scores of people have also gone missing. He wrote, The most major base that I've been able to follow the craft towards is located in the Tonto National Forest. I discovered this while camping in the Sierra Ancha Wilderness. The UFOs kept flying down into the basin two minutes apart. They flew low out of the southeast at about 2,000 feet above the terrain. During the daytime, A-10s used the area for training. Refueling practice also occurs here both day and night. These areas have also been plagued with several unexplained disappearances that have occurred in Cochise County over the last 30 years. Cars are abandoned with people's ID, money, and keys left behind. Alleged bases include a huge underground one near Dulce, New Mexico, about 250 miles from the Tonto National Forest, a base for species of aliens known as Tall Whites within the Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, and also an alien-slash-military base at the top-secret Area 51 U.S. Air Force site, also in Nevada. So why would the Air Force need such a large area of land? Because they gave some of it to aliens to build underground bases so they don't accidentally encounter a person and kill them. Today, we'll be discussing the oddities, legends, and weird speculations regarding the Denver International Airport. We ask that you please share the links in the description box and share this video with your family and friends on social media so we continue to bring you more strange content. We also ask that you use courtesy and respect for others in the comments section while discussing this location. Now sit back, relax, strap on your tinfoil hat, and let's begin. Denver International Airport is the largest airport by landmass in the United States and is twice the size of Manhattan, occupying some 35,000 acres of land. It's located just 25 miles away from downtown Denver, and the airport opened way over budget and far behind schedule in February of 1995. Although the airport is larger than Chicago O'Hare and Dallas-Fort Worth airports combined, most of it is flat land that is unoccupied, with the actual airport itself taking up very little of the 35,000 acres. Questions immediately came about as to why this airport would cost almost $5 billion to construct and why it was even needed in the first place. After all, Stapleton International Airport, which is much closer to Denver itself, was fully functioning already 
and seemingly much more convenient. The justifications given were that the larger runways would cut down on wait times coming in and out of the new airport. Also, the more remote location made it so that there wouldn't be as much noise disturbance in residential areas from planes coming and going daily. Likewise, the remote location was considered safer than a residential area in terms of a crash during takeoff or landing. Now, those in charge of the airport seem to actually purposely fuel these strange rumors as they never officially deny any of the wild claims, not even publicly. Our first nefarious rumor coming from DIA talks of who or what was actually behind the construction. Many believe it was directed by the NWO or New World Order. Those who study such things point to the dedication marker which credits the New World Airport Commission for building the airport. If you're thinking this is merely coincidence, think again, as even the airport's website fully admits that this organization doesn't actually exist. There are also many strange markings all over the floors of the airport, which seem to some to also be connected to the NWO. These markings are said by some to represent a new strain of hepatitis, which will be used in biological warfare to get the world's population under control. This being so the New World Order can microchip whoever's allowed to live. That way, the remaining citizens can be monitored in an Orwellian fashion, therefore ensuring the world never again becomes overpopulated, as well as also ensuring the most powerful members of society survive. The next contrivance that has many of those with esoteric knowledge thinking there's something villainous going on at this most aesthetically pleasing airport is part of the airport's 40-piece art exhibit. One of these is the Mustang statue, a.k.a. the Big Blue Horse, a.k.a. Blucifer. This 30-foot-tall fiberglass sculpture with its glowing red eyes is said to represent one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Is it merely a coincidence that the artist who created the statue was killed two years prior to finishing it when a piece fell off and severed an artery in his leg? Despite this malevolent Mustang's bad reputation, it continues to keep watch over all who come and go from Denver International Airport. Rumors also abound regarding all the extra and seemingly unnecessary space at the airport, with the most ominous one stemming not from the time capsule buried on the property, which definitely has symbols of the Freemasons carved into it, with the Freemasons allegedly being linked to the Bavarian Illuminati, a part of the NWO, but of the exorbitantly expensive, however never actually working and since abandoned, baggage claim area. It's rumored to actually be a clever cover-up for the above-ground entrance to the supposed secret tunnels and bunkers which are said to exist below Denver International. Some are quick to point to the bunkers as being in exchange for the Illuminati bestowing the extra billions of dollars needed when the airport went over budget during construction. These tunnels are allegedly an underground lair for the Freemasons or the Illuminati. Some speculate that when many of the original buildings meant for the airport were not built properly, at least five in total, instead of destroying them, the Freemasons took them over and just built buildings on top of them, thus giving them their own bunkers to hide in comfortably and safely when the aforementioned hepatitis outbreak hits and the entire world population is at risk for certain and sudden death. The bunkers contained in these underground tunnels will be used to house the world's most elite and well-to-do, leaving the rest of us to fend for ourselves during a biological war. Now, it is a fact that these buildings do exist, and also, they were just built over and not demolished. There's yet another wild conjecture about those who constructed these underground bunkers. It said some of the secret underground tunnels lead directly to the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, which is located only about 100 miles south of the airport in Colorado Springs. And who would find this more useful than the evil and alien lizard people? Yes, some claim these lizard people secretly run the world, control the news media, and even take over the bodies of our most beloved and most loathed celebrities. 
These bunkers and tunnels would surely make it easier to carry out their sinister plots against humans in secret, eventually taking over the entire world and the bodies of the world's most elite, therefore eliminating, some speculate by eating, the entire human race. Our final look into a few of the many strange notions surrounding the Denver International Airport is the artwork and how it points to the apocalypse and the end of the world. The first mural depicts, albeit in a very bright and bedazzling colors, a dead girl lying in a coffin, horrific scenes of trees burning, animals in glass cages, and crying children dispersing in all directions, seemingly trying to get away from the terrible destruction depicted in this giant mural. Another showpiece that is seemingly a harbinger of the mass chaos and destruction the Illuminati and NWO, and possibly the Reptilians, are to help bring about depicts a gas mask wearing soldier carrying a large firearm and sword wreaking havoc while a caravan of refugees flee his presence and narrowly escape the carnage he seems to be inflicting. There's also a depiction of a deceased child in someone's arms, children sleeping right above the deadly soldier, and a small child holding a teddy bear while hiding and trying to stay out of this death monger's line of sight. This mural goes on to convey the death of this same soldier and many children celebrating above his body. Now while many consider this wildly inappropriate to be looking at when you're about to board a plane, those who study the arcane will tell you these murals serve a purpose. And that's to warn us of what's actually going on in and below Denver International Airport, as inevitable to most common people as it may be. So what do you make of all this? Regardless of how they're interpreted, these oddities do absolutely exist within what many consider to be the strangest airport in the world. Today, we're going to delve a little further into St. Germain, who you may remember from our episode about mysterious Mount Shasta in Northern California. It was on this mountain where occultist and author Guy Ballard claimed to have encountered St. Germain, who identified himself as an ascended master. After a series of meetings with the Ascended Master, Ballard claims he was able to channel St. Germain's wisdom and plans for implementing the Seventh Golden Age, the I Am, which Germain stated would bring about a new age of earthly perfection. But in addition to being an Ascended Master, was St. Germain also a vampire? Vampire stories stretch back to France in the illustrious 1700s where there was a mysterious man who charmed the courts of Europe. The Comte, or Count, Saint Germain, was a very strange, extraordinary, enigmatical character. He was a master of the piano and the violin, could converse in six different languages, and his skills as a conversationalist were unrivaled, a skill that is, nowadays, a lost art. His wealth was unfathomable. He carried gems around in his clothing, and no one knew how he came into such wealth. No one knew anything about his family, where he came from, or who he was. One of his greatest passions was alchemy, and he was believed to have an extraordinary talent for not aging. Maybe it was his vast knowledge of cosmetics and herbs that kept him young. The philosopher Voltaire called him the man who knows everything and who never dies. No one really knew his true age. He looked about 40 in all of his portraits and continued to appear so for over half a century. Although he was charming and engaging and graced the dinner tables of many dukes and kings, no one had ever saw him eat anything. He would only sip his wine exquisitely and ramble on about everything from history to chemistry. Fast forward to New Orleans, Louisiana, and there appears a man by the name of Jacques St. Germain who fits every description of the Count above. Around 40 years of age, with heavy money bags, the most fascinating of dinner guests, and still a complete mystery. He would throw lavish parties and invite the elite. Everyone would sit enraptured in the conversation and food, but curiously enough, this Jacques St. Germain would never eat a morsel, only sip his wine. But one night, he had a lady stay a bit late, out on his balcony at the corner of Ursuline and Royal Streets. This St. Germain grabbed her and tried to bite her neck. 
She escaped by falling from the balcony and then reported the incident to the police. When the police came to investigate, Jacques St. Germain had vanished. They searched his apartment and found tablecloths with large splotches of blood on them. They searched the kitchen, where they found no sign of food or evidence that food had ever been there. All they found were bottles of wine. And, after pouring themselves a glass, drinking it, and then spitting it out, they discovered that it was not only wine in those bottles, but wine mixed with human blood. To this day, this mysterious figure has his own occult following, from theosophists to complete way-out-there mystics. The Count was purported to die in the year 1784, although no one saw his death, and some claim to have seen him many years after this date. Nevertheless, he disappeared from court life. In terms of murder, New Orleans rates among the highest. It has always been a notorious place for missing persons. That is, it is a place where people just disappear and no one ever knows what happened to them. The blood of the French, Spanish, Indian, African, Creole, and English all mixed together here where the mosquito is not so picky. Nor, perhaps, are other creatures. John and Wayne Carter were brothers. They seemed to be normal in every aspect, held normal labor jobs down by the river, and lived on a street in the French Quarter. It was the 1930s during the Depression, and times were hard, so a man worked all he could. One day, a girl was reported to have escaped from the Carter brothers' apartment and run to the authorities. Her wrists were cut, not enough to cause immediate death, but enough to cause her blood to drain slowly over the next several days. The policeman ran to the Carter's third-story apartment and found four other people tied to chairs with their wrists sliced in the same fashion. Some had been there for many days. The story was that these brothers had abducted these people in order to drink their blood at the end of every day when they came home from work. Police also found about 14 dead bodies. The cops waited for the brothers to return, and when they did, it took seven or eight of them to hold down the two average-sized men. A few years later, when the Carters were finally executed, their bodies were placed in a New Orleans vault. Cemeteries in New Orleans are quite picturesque. Not only are they more ornate than the rest of the nations, but they inter many generations of one family inside one vault. The remains sift down into the bottom of the vault, and when it's all rubble, a new body is slid inside. Many years after the Carter brothers' death, when they were placing some other Carter in the family vault, they discovered the vault was completely empty. No John or Wayne. They were gone. To this day, many sightings have occurred in the French Quarter that match the descriptions of these two brothers almost exactly. Years later, an owner of their apartment saw two figures that matched their descriptions outside on the balcony one night, whispering to each other. Both figures jumped off the top of the third-story balcony and took off running. The rumor is that if a vampire drinks of your blood seven nights in a row, then and only then can you become a vampire. Some of those found in the Carter brothers' apartment had been there over seven days. One warped fellow named Philippe went on to become a notorious serial killer. And of course, he would do more than just kill his victims. He was believed to have drank all 32 of his victims' blood. During the colonization of New Orleans, France was having a hard time getting women to go over there. This was mostly due to the fact that the men originally sent were thieves, murderers, and culprits of every type and caste, not to mention Louisiana snakes, alligators, mosquitoes, and deadly humidity. Eventually, some women were sent. Some sources say they were nuns, while others say they were prostitutes. But nevertheless, a few of them made it. Many of them snuck off ship in Mobile, Alabama when they ported there and were told what type of riffraff they would be tricked into marrying if they stayed on board. These girls had the most interesting luggage, shaped like little coffins. So, to the New Orleans men's dismay, all that arrived in New Orleans were 300 of these coffin-like suitcases. Some stories say that they were empty, some say they contained the undead. These suitcases were reportedly stored in the attic of a convent in the French Quarter, where they still sit behind windows that are nailed shut because they have a strange habit of just opening by themselves. 
Years later, in 1978, two amateur reporters demanded that the convent's priest let them in to see the coffins. The priest, of course, denied their entrance. So one night, these two men climbed over a wall with the recording equipment and set up their workstation. The next morning, the reporter's equipment was found strewn about on the street outside, and there on the convent's front steps were found the almost decapitated bodies of these two men. Eighty percent of their blood was gone. To this day, this unsolved crime baffles investigators. And there you have it. Was the mysterious St. Germain a true vampire whose bloodline apparently continues to this day in New Orleans and beyond? Let us know what you think in the comments below. The Mystery of the Tunguska Event In 1908, one of the most catastrophic, mind-blowing, and mysterious cosmic impact catastrophes ever in the history of civilization occurred in Siberia. However, this event wasn't widely known outside Russia until around the 1970s. Even interested search parties didn't learn about or even set foot on the scene of disaster until 1921. It didn't make front page news in the papers when it happened because of the extreme remoteness of that region of Siberia. Also at play was the secretive, unsettled nature of Russia at the time, which of course only heightened the many conspiracy theories surrounding it today. Even though there is much speculation and controversy about what exactly the mysterious Tunguska explosion of 1908 was, based on recordings at meteorological stations at that time, the seismic activity measured 5.0 on the Richter scale. And according to devices worldwide, the air compression wave went twice around the entire planet, bouncing both times. The blast itself, in whatever context it might have occurred, is estimated to have been 40 megatons, which is 2,000 times the force of the atomic bomb exploded over Hiroshima in 1945. Even the asteroid impact that caused the Great Behringer Crater in Arizona some 50,000 years ago is only estimated to have been equal to 3.5 megatons. The mass of the object has been guessed at about 100,000 tons and about 60 meters in diameter. But what exactly made up this mass is unclear, although most agree it was probably a loose glob of rocks and ice. Tungus tribesmen and Russian fur traders happened to witness the event from a relatively close range and reported seeing a bright, flaming object coming in from the sky at an angle. And then a giant, bright blast. According to some eyewitness accounts, a giant column of flame and smoke arose in the air from the impact spot. The force of the first heat wave and then the wind blast was enough to flatten huts and knock people and livestock airborne while burning and scorching them, and then back down to the ground again. Forty miles from the blast center at a town called Vanavara, people were thrown into the air by the shock wave. According to reports there, it shattered windows and collapsed ceilings. Near the town of Kansk, 370 miles from the blast center, at a stop on the Trans-Siberian Railway, a train screamed to a halt when the engineer feared it would be thrown from its tracks by the violent shaking as passengers were jolted from their seats by the movement. The sound was deafening, and there were reports of some people close by actually becoming deaf from the event. A series of thunderclaps could be heard even 500 miles away. And, although there were some serious injuries, to date there have been no records of human deaths from the event. A black rain showered the immediate area afterwards. The substance was probably condensation mixed with dirt and debris sucked up into the swirling vortex of the explosion and then spread out again. The event caused all kinds of climate changes around the planet. Dust in the air at heights of from 40 to 70 kilometers caused high altitude noctilucence or night shining clouds that illuminated much of the visible sky, mostly in eastern Siberia and Middle Asia. Even in London at the time, there are newspaper accounts of a night sky so luminous that one could read by it. Decreased visibility was reported worldwide, and in daytime, the areas with the most polluted atmosphere caused visible rings around the sun's glare. Also, obviously, brilliant sunsets were reported worldwide for weeks. The site of the impact has been excavated numerous times. Russian scientist Leonid Kulik was the first to brave the area in 1921, but no evidence of a huge meteorite has been found, although fragments of meteorite-like elements have been found in the area. 
More importantly, no impact crater of any type has been located. The trees in what is believed to be the impact site's epicenter were stripped of their branches but were oddly left standing amongst the miles of charred and flat ones surrounding out from them. Exactly like the effect of the bomb dropped at Hiroshima, which was also an airborne explosion. In the 1960s, a research troop identified four smaller epicenters within the larger one. Each of the smaller epicenters has its own radial tree fall pattern, and each presumably was caused by individual explosions during the chain of bursts. Most agree that all this adds up to a meteorite that was made up of loosely conjoined materials, ice, rocks, etc., that exploded upon reaching the Earth's atmosphere and obliterated into a zillion untraceable pieces, the force of this impact causing the immense destruction. The size and magnitude of the blast destruction and its location and timing are frightening to ponder. If it was a meteorite, it is the only event in the history of civilization where Earth has collided with a truly large celestial object, although what occurred before recorded civilization and are likely to in the far future are up for grabs. If the object had waited a mere few hours, the rotation of the Earth would have placed its impact somewhere in Europe. Boom, half a million people wiped out in seconds would not have been able to see it coming at all. The historical ramifications of such an epic catastrophe, not to mention the theological ones, are incalculable. The most notable theories throughout the ages have been the following. The loose comet slash asteroid theory. This one is pretty straightforward and simple. Antimatter. It classifies as material with a reversed charge at the subatomic level. It is theorized to exist in very small quantities floating around in our universe and has actually been created by scientists in laboratories. However, when antimatter meets up with real matter, it explodes. The theory here is that some wayward drifting antimatter came in contact with Earth and exploded when touching our thick, lower atmosphere. An explosion of this type would behave very similarly to the one created by an atomic bomb. Mini Black Hole some cosmologists theorize that many black holes were created at the birth of our universe and are just floating around aimlessly like little whirlpool ripples. Not big enough to swallow whole galaxies, but powerful enough to wreak havoc with anything they come in contact with. Apparently some feel the Tunguska explosion could have been caused by one of these many black holes passing through our planet like a ghost. Blaming Nikola Tesla some theorize that everyone's beloved nutty professor, Nikola Tesla, was testing out some sort of weird phantasmagorical communication device or super scary energy weapon or even a death ray and made a big whoops. Tesla was known to be working on a sort of wireless torpedo called Intel Automaton, which was a remote control boat he offered to the U.S. Navy for the purpose of carrying explosives to naval targets. An airborne version of the Tel Automaton device was under development as well. Some also believe that if there was a Tesla connection and it was a weapon test, then he may have been pressured into it and then kept quiet. Additionally, the theory that Tesla inadvertently caused a massive explosion when he was trying to get the attention of an explorer friend in the area. Tesla was always fascinated with the concept of wireless propagation and he was known to work on projected wave energy processes that could create microcosmic invisible particles of concentrated energy that could be beamed great distances, often resulting in electric fireballs, spherical plasmoids, or ball lightning. Why not use it to get someone's attention who's not near a telegraph service? A UFO inadvertently crashing into the Earth and its nuclear-powered engine exploding into smithereens. This is one of the more popular theories among extraterrestrial believers. Some have claimed that the remote location of the explosion was obviously an act of humanitarian kindness on the part of the aliens who realized they were going to crash and quickly guided their greening craft into an area where there were almost no civilians. Today, the Tunguska region remains a not too hospitable, desolate area of mosquito infested bogs and swamps nestled between sort of beautiful hills. To reach the center of the site, you're dropped off by helicopter or you have to hike in. There have been a series of weird ongoing biological consequences in the Tunguska region, presumably from the 1908 explosion. Following the blast, there was accelerated growth of biomass in the region of the epicenter, and this accelerated growth has continued today. 
There also was an increase in the rate of biological mutations, not only within the center, but along the trajectory. Creepy abnormalities in the RH blood factor of local Evink groups and native people to the area for centuries have been found. Genetic variations in certain local ant species are now being looked at, and genetic abnormalities in the seeds and needle clusters of at least one species of pine have been discovered there. This is the strange story of the little boy and his robot grandma. On October 1st, 2010, three and a half year old John Doe, as he's being reported, and his relatives were camping by a popular fly fishing location near Mount Shasta. Around 6 p.m., the child's parents realized their son had suddenly gone missing. According to Mr. Doe, his youngster was there one second and gone the next. They scoured the area he had last been seen in, complete panic-stricken horror. After hours of feverishly searching, the little boy still had not turned up. Now desperate, the distraught father decided to call local police deputies and United States Forest Service officers. Rescue personnel combed the forest well into the night, yet there was no sign of the toddler. Five hours after John had disappeared, Authorities found him laid down on the brush directly next to a trail that had been previously searched. He appeared to be in a dazed, semi-conscious state. Mr. and Mrs. Doe attributed this to exhaustion and were simply grateful their little one returned physically unharmed. Medical staff gave full clearance so the freshly reunited family were permitted to return home. Everyone's lives quickly went back to normal. Yet, only a few weeks later, the small boy would share a disturbing tale about his terrifying ordeal. One day, little John's grandmother Kathy, who he called Cappy, was playing with him. Suddenly, he looked towards her and said that he didn't like the other grandma Cappy. Confused, she asked him what exactly he meant. Little John explained that while he was lost in the woods, he'd been taken deep inside a mountainside cave by a woman he thought was Grandma Cappy. She led him into a cool, dark, spider-infested room filled with motionless humanoid robots. Scattered across the floor were dusty purses, guns, and other various types of weapons. As John anxiously faced his grandmother, he noticed an eerie light radiating from her head. In this moment, he realized she was not his real granny. Grandma Cappy firmly instructed the boy to defecate on a piece of paper. When he refused, she became increasingly agitated and repeatedly requested him to do so. Eventually, the grandma lookalike succumbed to frustration and moved on to a different topic. Allegedly, she informed little John that he had been planted in his mother's womb and was actually from outer space. Shortly after this extraordinary account, she took the boy back outside to a thicket and advised him to wait for help. Upon hearing this disturbing story from her grandson, an outraged Grandma Kathy called her son and demanded to know what he was allowing her grandchildren to watch on television. Mr. Dole lamented that he had heard an identical recollection only a few days prior. Initially, the two chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Yet the more Grandma Kathy thought about it, the more Little John's story perplexed her. What kind of TV show would feature some of the ludicrous topics that the boy was describing? Even more chilling was the idea that she might have some kind of doppelganger assuming her identity in order to abduct innocent victims. With those particular thoughts in mind, Kathy decided to share a haunting experience of her own. Only a year before, she had gone on a camping trip within close proximity to where Little John's ordeal occurred. In the morning, she awoke face down in the dirt. Somehow, she had been inexplicably removed from the sleeping bag within her tent and transferred a short distance away. Upon rousing, she felt an intense pain at the base of her neck. Two puncture wounds were present, and the surrounding skin was red and inflamed. Another friend who accompanied her on the excursion suffered a matching affliction. The pair originally attributed these injuries to a possible spider bite. Both Kathy and her travel companion became violently ill. In fact, she was so sick that she could not even muster the strength to pack her things. Her mind raced as she desperately tried to recall what happened mere hours ago. Only one thing surfaced. 
glowing red eyes. While she was drifting into slumber, she remembered seeing several creatures gazing through the darkness. At the time, she assumed they were produced by a herd of deer. Following this traumatizing outing, Kathy felt completely drained of her creativity and emotions. Several months would pass before she felt like her old self again. Admittedly, Grandma Cappy would have dismissed her episode had little John not come forward with his first-hand encounter. Now, listeners to this channel are no doubt familiar with the legends and lore pertaining to Mount Shasta that have existed throughout the centuries. We've done a video about it. The indigenous peoples of the area chronicled a fallen race of prehistoric giants that were said to inhabit the region. Others claim beings known as Lemurians use local caves as entrances to an underground crystalline city called Telos. Some allege a large energy vortex is present within the territory. In modern times, there are many UFO and Bigfoot sightings reported. Each year, though, 26,000 visitors flock to this revered mountain from countries across the globe. There have been an alarmingly high number of curious missing person cases within this picturesque terrain. While little John Doe's incident seems unbelievable, it's important to consider the odd history and happenings afflicting this area. An open mind may be the only thing that will finally resolve this age-old mystery. Well, folks, there you have it. What do you think about this case? Let us know in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like and share it with your friends on social media. By liking and sharing our videos, you're helping our channel and videos to get noticed by the YouTube algorithm. Till we meet again, take care of yourselves and each other. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.